It's so important that we're all here today to be able to hear everybody's message and then to understand how we can all be making a better difference. Somebody who's been doing this for a very long time and who's been leading the moment, movement, and the moment, actually, is Joan Gusso. Uh, Joan has wrote extensively about this issue. Um, if you haven't read her, her first book, This Organic Life, I strongly recommend that you go out and get it. And I just have to mention, because I didn't know this, that Joan has just finished another book, which has been produced uh, by Chelsea Green called Growing Older, A Chronicle of Death, of Death, Life, and Vegetables, which definitely appeases to me in my composting. So please give a huge hand to Joan Gusso. shocking how totally ignorant I was 
until fairly recently about the astounding mass of organisms that were living more or less happily in the various soils that I tilled. Oh, I was familiar with this, what soil people often refer to as the megafauna. <laughs> I always love the word megafauna about worms and millipedes and <laughs> centipedes and sow bugs. And I had obviously heard, as many of you have, of the fact that there were millions of microorganisms, much smaller, below the soil. Most of them too small to be seen by the naked eye. But two Christmases ago, a friend sent me a book, that one of those books that totally changes your life. It's a book by Professor David Wolf of Cornell, and it's called Tales from the Underground. Push your thumb and index finger into the root zone of the patch of grass, Wolf advises, and bring up a pinch of earth. You will likely be holding close to one billion individual living organisms. Notice he said a pinch, and he said a billion. Perhaps 10,000 distinct species of microbes, most of them not yet named, cataloged, or understood, interwoven with the thousands of wispy root hairs of the grass, would be coils of microscopic, gossamer-like threads of fungal hyphae, the total length of which would be measured in miles, not inches. Mind you, he says there are 10,000 species, not organisms, not individual creatures, but species of microbes, and miles of fungal threads, quote, most of them not yet named, cataloged, or understood. And that's in just a pinch of Earth. Wolf goes on to say that we know so little, at least partly because it's impossible to study these organisms in the laboratory. Scientists are lucky, he says, quote, if they can come up with the right nutrient mix to culture and study 1% of the microbes found in a typical soil sample. This poor success rate is due in part to the complex interdependence between subterranean organisms. They can't survive when isolated from their neighbors, as the rest of us can, but we have yet to learn that, right? So that's what's underneath, interacting with our plants upstairs, billions of interdependent organisms about which we know very little. And now I have to divert briefly to something depressing, but I promise I'll be brief and then I'll return to home. <laughs> you probably know that many of our major crops are now planted with genetically engineered seeds. I'll refer to them as GE from here on. Most people believe they're not eating anything made with GE materials, but since 94% of soy and 88% of corn planted in the U.S. are GE, and since products made from soy and corn are in almost all processed foods, I found out I can't get organic corn oil anymore, because I don't think they can get any corn from the U.S. that isn't contaminated. So it's in almost all processed foods, and most people who think they aren't eating any of that are living in a dream. The great majority of these two crops, soy and corn, are Roundup ready, meaning they're engineered to survive being sprayed with the weed killer Roundup, which is Monsanto's proprietary name for the chemical glyphosate. This means a farmer can simply plant his or her crop, and when it comes up and is growing well, they can just fly over it and spray it with glyphosate. And, and all, all the weeds will die and the plant will do fine. This, of course, means that a hell of a lot of glyphosate is being sprayed on U.S. farm fields. Last year, the USDA was asked to approve for widespread planting a Roundup Ready version of our principal forage crop, alfalfa, the crop most fed to animals, the crop on which dairy, organic dairy, is totally dependent. In January 2011, before the decision was made, a noted crop scientist, Emeritus Professor Don Huber of Purdue University, wrote a letter to the USDA Secretary Vilsack describing a series of very disturbing problems affecting production agriculture that appeared to be related to glyphosate and urging that the decision be postponed to allow for more research. The identified problems included infertility and early term abortions in cattle and hogs fed on GMO crops, largely corn and soy. A loss of the next generation of animals that was putting some dairy farmers out of business. Researchers in the field were also noticing the rise of harmful fungi and parasites, while beneficial fungi and other organisms that help plants utilize minerals were declining 
Those are some of the organisms I was talking about earlier. Professor Huber warned that there would seem to be a new pathogen, apparently related to the use of glyphosate, that was affecting the health of plants in the field and of animals fed those plants. I believe the threat we are facing from this pathogen is unique and of a high-risk status, Huber wrote. In layman's terms, it should be treated as an emergency. Now, this is a very mature scientist who's widely published. He's not some crank out there on the internet just saying something. <laughs> Huber asked the Secretary of Agriculture to slow down the approval of yet another glyphosate crop, Roundup, alfalfa, Roundup Ready Alfalfa, to allow time for careful studies of the pathogen and its effects. The letter he sent confidentially to the Secretary of Vil Vilsack was leaked, apparently, by the Secretary's office. And by the end of January, Vilsack approved the unrestricted planning of Roundup Ready Alfalfa. Since Professor Hubert's observations have been widely circulated on the blogosphere, there has been major pushback denunciations, denials, criticisms by scientists about Huber's failure to pr provide detailed studies, and so on. Although a few other scientists, in the teeth of a flood of hostile attacks, are reporting problems with crops and animals exposed to Roundup. At this point, the din of denial is so noisy that it's impossible to sort out how much of what Huber has reported is accurate. Though what is known is that any researcher who comes up with a negative finding about genetically engineered crops will be viciously demonized by the companies. The undeniable fact is that USDA has decided to allow a glyphosate-resistant form of the nation's most important forage crop, a crop grown on millions of acres, to be planted at will, thus exposing even more soil organisms to the already widely used glyphosate. And although we don't know much about any of the organisms that are down there getting hit, what we do know, as Professor Huber pointed out in a seminar he gave last March, is that when you change one thing, everything else in the web of life changes in relationship. In other words, spray something that harms some soil organisms, and others will multiply to take their place. So that's my war story, which brings me to hope. Some of you will have heard this story before, but I hope it's interesting enough that you won't mind hearing it again. In the March of 2010, my beloved garden on the west bank of the Hudson River was utterly destroyed by that river. Thanks to what I've interpreted as a generous gesture from Mother Nature, I was able to get access to my land and fill in a sunken space in which I had been gardening, so that after such storms, and another one came last August, my land at least drains. Of course, before I could put in a new elevated garden, I had to take up every paper, brick, plant, tree, bulb, corn, anything in my yard, bring in 200 yards of the stuff they excavate when they start to construct a new building, put a little topsoil over it, and start over, replacing every paper, brick, plant, tree, bulb, corn, whatever, and then planting the year's crops. Most of the rebuilt garden ended up with some topsoil, but in the end, four by 12, Three, four, four three by 12 foot beds had none. They were filled at the top with the kind of stuff they dig out when you build a house. And it was so rock hard that when a friend came by with a pickaxe to break it up, we tossed the lumps from the surface into the river because we couldn't even break them up. How could I begin to turn this dead concrete-like stuff into fertile soil? I knew how to do it over time, but I wanted to use the bed now and I struggled to imagine what might agree to grow there. I did what digging I could, taking out boulders the size of my head and pails of other rocks, and decided to plant sweet potatoes in one of the beds because it had been my experience that sweet potatoes would grow anywhere, and it would at least cover the bed with nice-looking foliage, even if I didn't get any sweet potatoes. So in mid-June, I went out and I dug some holes and I put a little, I put a little uh, lime and fertilizer in each one, and I planted the slips and said, good luck. As expected, uh, I got a wonderful bed of foliage, which at least made it look nice. And come October, a friend and I dug in to see what had happened underground. Considering the situation, I had a remarkably good crop, 23 pounds of sweet potatoes from a bed three feet wide and 12 feet long. But what really astonished me was not the crop, 
but what its presence had done underground. In one growing season, the sweet potato roots had converted a bed of silt that hardened into rock when you looked at it into a crumbly soil that you could plunge your hand into. After vainly trying to find evidence on the web that this beneficial effect of growing sweet potatoes was common knowledge, I concluded that it wasn't. Everyone I spoke to was stumped until I talked to a farmer who was also a trained microbiologist. He was the first person I talked to who wasn't really surprised. You can do that with turnips or daikon or any big rooted crop, he told me. The soil organisms that collect around the root hairs for sugar from the crop secrete a compound called glomalin that glues together the fine soil particles to prevent them from packing into a rock-like mass. When I asked him for details, he sent me a pamphlet titled, What is Glomalin? Here's part of the text. Glomalin was identified at USDA in the early 90s on hi-fi, hair-like projections of our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. These fungi are ancient microorganisms that evolved with plants to aid in acquiring nutrients, especially immobile nutrients like phosphorus. So now we know. Here's an ancient, vital organism, absolutely critical to the texture, the phosphorus availability, and therefore the production capacity of our soils. As the pamphlet on Glomalin says, it is literally holding our farms together. And yet, as another soil book of mine reports, Glomalin was, quote, considered an unidentified contaminant of humus until 1996. We farmed in total ignorance of this organism until 15 years ago. And so it's clear that we're growing our food in massive ignorance, as if nature were an enemy and we were at war with her, drenching our soils with chemical novelties, bombing our fields with toxins, to kill organisms that we have deemed our foes with no concern that we might in the process be killing our friends. And to turn back to my war story, We've now dumped a single chemical glyphosate on literally millions of acres of soil year after year after year on the assumption that it would only do what we intended it to do, which was to kill weeds. But we don't need Professor Huber's assertions to know that glyphosate is changing the invisible life of the soil. And it's clear to me from my own discovery that the underground organisms that most of us are hardly aware of are perhaps more vital to our long-term survival as a species than any of the larger living things we encounter every day. Stumbling across an old review last week of a book titled Cultures of War gave me the idea that I want to end with today. The author concludes his review by noting that it's, quote, the nature of a system to isolate and disable challenges to its fundamental assumptions. When the machine is racing furiously, doubts are just so much sand in the gears. It seems to me that part of what we're all about here is being sand in the gears. We are, of course, most importantly about trying to help provide the workers with access to wholesome food from local farmers. But by doing so in a way that creates and sustains communities, and the natural world that supports us all, we're also raising doubts about the food system as it currently functions. We're challenging the fundamental assumption that the only way people will be fed in the future is by novel products whose raw materials are grown by high-tech, diversity-killing agriculture. Our presence, the astonishing growth of Just Food, the miracle that just Food supported CSAs went in 15 years from serving a few hundred eaters to serving 36,000 today is a challenge to that assumption. We are sand in the gears of a destructive system and we need to keep growing. Thank you.